with you. Join me. I'm a child of God. I'm saved by grace. I live each day by faith. Thank goodness. And I'm ready to hear God's word. Let's stand for the word of God. Let's get that part and then we'll back up, okay? As I, as I look through our uh, study for today, God clearly was leading us to a, a, a reflection on forgiveness and our need to practice forgiveness. So I thought we'd look at a couple of things that Jesus said about that subject. Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Which maybe is one reason Paul says in Colossians 3.13, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. May God bless this thought as people sit. Amen. Have a seat. Like I said, I really see God's wisdom as he takes us through. You know, sometimes when you study through the life of a Bible character, you end up coming to things that in God's way of leading us in our study, God puts us where we need to be. Because one of the things that we need to work on in our lives is forgiveness. And that's why I asked this opening question. Is there anyone in your life that you need to forgive? Now, I don't, I'm not asking for confession because I know the answer to that is probably yes. I suspect there's not a one of us in this room that doesn't have a, 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 a favorite target that's still in the back of our mind. Somebody we still hold at a distance, an injustice. The reason forgiveness is such a doggone hard thing to do is because forgiveness, stem, the need for forgiveness stems from a personal injustice we've suffered. You know, if somebody, if somebody hits Terry, I don't have a problem with that. That's okay. It doesn't, it doesn't offend me. It offends him. I don't have to forgive the guy. It's a personal offense, isn't it? But now Terry may have to deal with that issue. And he will. He'll kill the guy, which is what God says not to do. And then he has to deal with forgiveness on another level. The problem with forgiveness is it's so intensely, the cause, the need for it is so intensely personal. It is, is, is an offense against me. It has to be forgiven. And we've all been offended in life. We've all had people that have lied to us, betrayed us, harmed us, uh, said bad things about us, gone behind our backs, uh, whatever. Disappointed us. And so forgiveness is always there. So my question is, how's that process working for you? How clean is your slate versus how big a backlog do you have? How big a forgiveness backlog do you have of people that you still haven't let off the hook? And by the way, that can become a great burden because you've got to keep up with all those people, all those names and who they are and where they are and when you see them and how you're going to treat them and how you're not going to forgive them and all of that kind of stuff. So if you can clear your slate by just extending forgiveness, to use a rather red-hot word in our culture today, what if you extended amnesty to everybody on your hit list of, I would forgive you, but? Well, it would solve a lot of issues in life, wouldn't it? Oh, but they haven't asked my forgiveness. Who cares? In fact, in many cases, you may need to extend forgiveness to somebody who will never ask your forgiveness. Who would die before they would ask your forgiveness? At that point, a lack of forgiveness isn't their problem. We always want the guilty person to feel guilty, and half the time they don't. Molesters, sexual predators, they don't feel guilt. 
They feel entitlement. You'll never get them to say, I'm sorry. Bill Cosby made the statement the other day from prison that he'll never feel bad about the things he did because he didn't, doesn't think he did anything wrong. That's the words of a sociopath, a predator. He didn't do anything wrong. Never ask your forgiveness. It wasn't my fault I did what I did. It's your fault for being stupid and letting me. That's a predator. So then the lack of forgiveness becomes the anchor around your neck that destroys your life. There are four types of, of forgiveness in the world. First of all, there's delayed forgiveness. Delayed forgiveness says, I need to forgive you, but I want to let it, I want to let it ferment a little bit. I'm enjoying, I like, to, I like to see you dangling over the fire. When it looks like the skin is getting a little bit toasty and red, then I might forgive you. But I want to give it a little time because it satisfies me to make you suffer a little bit. I like to, be, I like to get a little satisfaction out of it. But, I, you know, eventually, yeah, I might maybe forgive you. I'll let you know when. A second kind of forgiveness is partial forgiveness. That's where I forgive you, but I really don't. Hmm? I'll forgive you, but I reserve the right to bring it up later. In marriage, I call that grab bagging. You kind of like go through married life like Santa Claus. You've got a big old bag with surprise packages inside. And the surprise packages are little gift-wrapped boxes of all the stuff you've done wrong over the years. And when we get in a little argument or I get a little bit mad at you, guess what? It's going to be happy surprise package day. I'm going to reach in that bag. I'm going to pull something out. It may be something from 91. It may be something from 2003. I talked with a couple one time for 30 years. She held something over him. I said, well, what, what? How can we get this out of your marriage? Because it's destroying your marriage. How can we get rid of this? What do you want? What does he need to do to get forgiveness for this? I said, if he cut his right leg off with a saw, would that be an adequate sacrifice? Well, I don't want him to do that. Well, I'm just asking. The guy is dying over here. He's trying to build a relationship. You're hanging on to this. You keep bringing it up. You keep bringing it up. You keep bringing it up. It is like cancer in your relationship. What does he need to sacrifice? And basically, but the bottom line is, he couldn't do anything. And I said, then your, your marriage is over. You're shot. Because if there's not honesty and openness and forgiveness in a relationship, you have no relationship. It's just not going to happen. Partial. I'll forgive you unless I need it later. The third kind is conditional, relationship, uh, 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 conditional forgiveness. I'll forgive you if you do certain things to satisfy my need for forgiving you. So you attach conditions. Well, let's give it three years and see how you do. Now, how are you going to give it three years? You talk about three years of wandering in the wilderness. You're talking about three years of no progress. You're talking about three years of static relationship. And then you don't know what's going to happen. So conditional. I'll forgive you if you ask for it. Like I said, you may die of old age waiting for that. Do you, do you ask God for everything he forgives you of? Do you specifically? Have you specifically gone through a catalog of every single itemized sin you ever committed in your life and ask God one by one by one by one by one to forgive you for each one of those? Or when you're baptized into Christ, did you just accept the fact that forgiveness was a blanket amnesty offered by God as an act of 
grace so that you don't have to worry about that. And even since then, can you remember every sin you've committed in the last week? Can you, for, can you remember every mistake you made? In the last, I can't even remember what I had for breakfast. This, I didn't have breakfast this morning. You know? The point is conditional. And, and then the other, kind of, the other kind of forgiveness is, of course, what? Unconditional forgiveness. Unconditional forgiveness says, I will forgive you not because you asked for it, but because you need it. I will forgive you because I need it. I will forgive you because I have experienced it. And I know what it feels to live under the dark cloud. And I know what it feels to be in the sewer. And how unpleasant it is. And out of my generic God-based love for you, I'm not going to put you in that position and I'm not going to put me in slavery to whatever you've done that offends me. You know, some people who have offended you did it because they like to. You ever met somebody who just likes to make you miserable? Yeah. And you know how you really tick them off? Stay happy and don't get miserable. It drives them crazy. It drives them nuts, nuts out of their minds. They don't know what to do because as long as they upset you, they control you. I tell kids that in bullying. As long as they get you to cry, they've got you. You're their piece of meat. They'll have a ball with you because every time they get a chance, they're going to poke you and make you cry again, and they love it. So, you know, life is full of a lot of that. Bullies don't end in seventh grade. Or, or in adulthood, either one. Now, let me say this about those four kinds of, of uh, forgiveness. Partial, right? What was it? Partial, what was my second one? Delayed, yeah. Partial, delayed, conditional. There's only one of those four that's acceptable to God. The only one. Now, listen, church. We're supposed to be different from the world around us. The only one God allows us to practice is number four. One, two, and three are off the board. They're just not available to us. That's what makes us different from the world because the world practices the other three and very seldom gets to the fourth. We're supposed to practice number four to the exclusion of the other three. Let me show you an example of this in the life of David. And, and let me make a couple of points as we look at this little short story. It involves David and a man named Shimei. S-H-I-M-E-I. Shimei. Shimei is described by one commentator as one of the reptiles of the human life, of the human world. He's a reptile. He's a mean, nasty vindictive, hateful man who likes nothing more than to catch a fellow down and out and go up and run up and kick him, kick him, kick him, kick him. He is mean, unforgiving. I mean, this guy's a nasty fellow. And, and so you, this is what we're going to deal with. Now, the first point I want to make is this. And again, if you're going to be a Christian, this is true. If you plan to serve God, you need some thick skin. Because you're going to have to take things that the average person wouldn't take. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to walk away from some situations that the average person would stand and fight in. You're going to have to turn the other cheek. You're going to have to give the second coat. You're going to have to walk the second mile. And those aren't human nature. We aren't made that way. Retaliation is going to have to be eliminated from your, uh, your vocabulary. Revenge is going to have to be taken out of your word catalog. Not an option. Christ died leaving us an example that we should walk in His steps. He was slapped and he did not retaliate. He was insulted and he did not speak back. Instead, he handed it over to God and let God deal with it. 
That is one of the hardest things in the world to do, to let injustice go into the hands of God and to realize that it may never get squared up in this life, but that it will get squared up. That's a hard thing to do. David is at a low point in his life. Now, we noticed that last week. He had lost his kingdom to his rebellious son Absalom. He'd been run out of the capital. He was on the road, you know, fleeing away from Jerusalem with his entourage. Absalom was getting ready to move in and take over the, the rule of the kingdom by force. David had done nothing wrong except raise a lousy kid. He's at a low point. And, it, you know, sometimes the Psalms are great passages, are, are great books, uh, poems, I guess they are to read in terms of letting you know how people feel. The Psalms are very frank. They're very visceral, very gut level in some of the things they say. One of, Psalms, one of the Psalms David wrote evidently during this period was Psalm 40. Listen to how he describes his life at this point. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord to help me, and he turned to me and heard my cry. Now listen to the descriptive language. And lifted me out of the pit of despair. You ever been in that one? Yeah, you ever been in the pit of despair? What's that commercial? The uh, pit of misery? Whatever that one commercial they have, the pit of misery where they get put. Dilly dilly, yeah. Well, have you ever been in the pit of despair? Despair is a word that means you're at your wit's end. You don't know what to do. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. Now, he's saying the positives, but what does that tell you? Was he on solid ground? Was he steady? He's shaky, isn't he? He's all over the place. He doesn't know where his life is going. He describes that in verse 12. He said, for troubles surround me, too many to count. You ever been there? Are you there right now? Sometimes it's overwhelming, isn't it? Sometimes the pile gets so high you can't see the light for the pile on top of you. My sins pile up so high I can't see my way out. They outnumber the hairs of my head. I have lost all courage. Now this is the, these are the words of a person at their wit's end. We would say in some cases that this kind of person would be what? Suicidal, right? This would be a good description of somebody who is having suicidal thoughts. You wouldn't blame them if they were because it, it, this is just about as bad as it can get. So David describes where he is. Now, as he's fleeing along with his entourage, they're crossing the hills east of Jerusalem trying to get out of the city before Absalom's troops arrive. And they're just kind of trudging along. We were told last week as they walked along it was dusty and hot and they were tired and hungry. And we noticed last week some of the sheltering trees that met him along the way and encouraged him. Well, guess what? Shimei is not a sheltering tree. Shimei is a whooping stick. He's a, he's a, he's a peach limb switch. His goal in life is to wear David out. Two or three verses. Listen to what he says. As King David came to Bahurim, a man came out of the village cursing them. Now, I think when the Bible says cursing, you can probably take that very literally. I think the writer cleans the language up for us a little bit, thank goodness. But you can assume if he's cursing David, he's cursing David. It was Shimei, son of Gerah, from the same clan as Saul's family. And he threw stones at the king and the king's officers and all the mighty warriors. First of all, the guy's not got good judgment. You got all these fully armed, macho, special forces guys walking along with their spears and swords. And this knucklehead's throwing rocks at them. Talk about poking a dog or poking a bear. Yeah. Get out of here, you murderer, you scoundrel, he shouted at David. The Lord's paying you back for all the blood shed in Saul's clan. You stole his throne. Now the Lord's given it to your son, uh, your son Absalom. 
and at last you'll taste some of your own medicine, for you are a murderer. Number one, did David do anything to harm Saul's family? That's a lie. Did David steal Saul's throne? It's a lie. Did the Lord give Absalom his throne? No. It's a lie. You ever been lied about by somebody? You ever had people accuse you of things you didn't even do? Or motives that you didn't even have? You may have had pure motives and they accuse you of having a false. You know, if somebody doesn't like you, they don't like you. It doesn't matter what you do, they're not going to like it. And if you do the right thing, it's for the wrong reason in their mind. You ever had that happen? Where somebody's accused you of doing the right thing for the wrong reason? Oh, he's just trying to make points with da-da-da-da-da. Hey, that's the way men think. That's the way people in the world think. That's the way they live. And by the way, when you engage in that toward others, you're living as a person in the world and not as a child of God. Paul says we're supposed to think about things that are what? Good, honest, noble? Yeah, pure. Not this kind of stuff. This guy is bitter. He don't, he don't like David. And he's throwing rocks, and I suspect knowing the ancient culture back then, he's throwing dung piles at him and all kinds of stuff. I mean, he don't like him. And he's really provoking. Now, what do David's friends advise? There's a reason the writer mentions that all the troops are with David. What's a soldier going to do to some guy like this? Yeah, he's going to whack him, isn't he? Real fast. Yeah, two hits, I hit you, you hit the ground. Yeah, so they advise retaliation. I love this. This is a very simple, I love this simple approach to somebody who treats you wrong. Many of us have had this whispered in our ear by a supporter or by the little red devil that sits on our shoulder all the time. Listen to this. Why should this dead dog curse my Lord the King Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, demanded, Let me go over and cut off his head. Yeah, just, just say the word. I'll go whack this guy. We'll take care of him. I mean, this is, this is a solvable problem. I'll just kill him. And that's a, that's a normal reaction, isn't it? Don't blame him a bit. And he thinks he's doing David a favor. But I want you to notice what David does. David, in this case, hands it over to God. He hands it over to God. And it's interesting the way he does it. Look what he says. David looks up and he says, no. And first of all, look at his first reaction. N-O. Most powerful word in the language. It'll keep you out of more sin and more temptation than a million other words. No. Hey, let's go do so-and-so. No. Oh, but it'll, no. What part of no do you not understand? The N or the O? There's only two letters. It's not hard. We need to learn to say no when, we, when Satan rears his head. Who asked your opinion, you sons of Zeruiah? If the Lord had told me to hold him to curse me, who are you to stop him? He says, I don't know. Maybe the Lord told him to yell at me. I deserve it. Has David made mistakes? Has David sowed a lot of seeds of sin in the days before had God told him that he would be rebelled against and that he would be punished by his family for his sins David says hey I don't know maybe the Lord told him to say that I'm not going to question that then David said to Abishai and all his servants my own son is trying to kill me doesn't this relative of Saul have even more reason to do so leave him alone let him curse for the Lord's told him to do it now listen to this this is faith this is the response of faith. And perhaps the Lord will see that I am being wronged and will bless me because of these curses today. So David and his men went on down the road and Shemai kept, he kept up with the same old stuff, cursing and throwing stones and dirt at David. So David says, just let it rest. He's not hurting us. He hasn't assaulted me. He's just, he's insulting me. Okay, fine. Let it alone. That is a hard thing to do. That is a hard thing to do. 
at least you'd like to stop and yell a few cuss words back at him, right? And it's not like he don't deserve it. And as we know later on from the story, Shammai is wrong. Now, I want you to fast forward me with me. We're going to fast forward three chapters and a year or so down the road, and things have changed. Remember how David said, perhaps the Lord will realize I'm being wrongly accused and will make it right for me, but he's going to leave it in the hands of God just as he did with Saul. It's not going to take it upon himself. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. That means when you seek vengeance, you are usurping the authority of God in your life. Well, as time has passed now, Absalom has worn out his welcome. David's troops have recaptured the capital city. Absalom has begun fleeing down the road. He gets his hair caught in the branches of a tree. He gets executed by Joab, the chief general of David's army. Absalom is now eliminated. David has the kingdom back, and he and his entourage are now traveling on the way back down the path they just went down a couple of years earlier. They're headed back to Jerusalem to resume the throne and the governance of the land. Has God turned the tables? Yes, he has. David is put back where he belongs. Now, at this point, one thing you would tend to do is, what would be the first thing you'd want to do if you were David? Now, think about it. You have just weathered a rebellion in the kingdom. What would your natural instinct be? Clean house. Right? This won't happen again. If anybody even looks at me with an eyebrow raised, they're gone. I'm done with this. I'm tired of it. No more. We're going to clean house. And especially if some moron comes running up that cussed at me and screamed and threw dung and dirt and rocks and stuff. Hey, listen, if I ever catch up with that guy, this is that delayed aspect. If I, you know, he would best, the best thing he could do is take like a world cruise and be gone for a long time. And then when he gets home, he needs to find some small isolated obscure little village out on the edge of the desert and he needs to go and settle there and live a very quiet life actually South America might not be a bad choice maybe he could go and live in Argentina or something because if he ever crosses my path again well I owe him first of all if you're forgiven by God in Christ you don't owe anybody including God. Before you hit back, take a hard look at both yourself and the other person. Okay? Eventually, as I said, Absalom is dethroned and David restored. So much, so good. Now, as David crosses the River Jordan to head back toward Jerusalem, guess who shows up? Shimei the knucklehead. And he's got his whole clan with him. And boy, is he playing suck up, man. He is, they are coming up. And he says they brought all their wagons and their mules. And they wanted to know, how can we help you? Is there anything we can carry? Your, your lordship, holy, wonderful majesty, the king, sir, that we admire so much and always did admire. And can we help you anymore? And I mean, they're really throwing out the welcome wagon for David. Okay. Now. Our first instinct would be to say what? Well, we know what you're doing. Don't you think that being nice to me is going to change anything? That's that conditional love. Shimei comes before David and repents. Look at this. Shimei, son of Gera, the man from Bahurim and Benjamin, hurried across with, his, with the men of Judah to welcome King David. A thousand other men from the tribe were with him, including Ziba, the chief servant of the house of Saul, Ziba's 15 sons and 20 servants. And they rushed down to the Jordan to meet the king. And they crossed the shallow, they waited out to bring the king's household across the river, helping him in every way they could. Whew. Yeah, right. He knows who's got the noose on his neck. 
And as the king was about to cross the river, Shimei fell down before him. My lord, the king, please forgive me, he pleaded. Forget the terrible thing your servant did when you left Jerusalem. Hey, leopard doesn't change its spots. How many times do you forgive a brother who sins against you? Which means what? As often as he asks. Forget the terrible thing your servant did when you left Jerusalem. May the king put it out of his mind. That's a hard part, isn't it? Yeah. I know how much I sinned. This is why I came here today. The very first person in all Israel to greet my lord the king. Now, this guy is saying all the right things. Just like we do when we come to Christ. We say all the right things because we know we need forgiveness and we really want forgiveness. And we'll say anything or do anything the Lord tells us to do to get forgiveness. But does the old man of sin walk away the minute we're baptized into Christ? Eh, not so much. So he is begging for forgiveness. And he's saying, just as we say to God, please just forget about it. Put it out of your mind. Well, guess who shows up? Abishai, <laughs> he's still there next to David. He's still got his trusty sword tucked away just waiting to get that thing out. He can't wait to start settling accounts. And he encourages David to retaliate. Then Abishai, son of Zeruiah, said, Shimei should die, for he cursed the Lord's anointed king. This dude has nursed this grudge since back when they left Jerusalem. He has stewed on this all this time. He was probably hoping he'd get a shot at this guy. And now, what a virtuous act of God. The guy has come and just thrown himself right in front of us. I don't even have to go find him. We don't even have to do a web search. He's right here. I can just see him holding that sword and saying, Well, you know what needs to be done here, don't you? Yeah, boy, I can... Just give me the word. I'll take care of this guy. You don't need guys like him around. We've been through enough. I'll take care of this. What does David do? He says no. He extends forgiveness. Now we're coming to category four. We've gone through forgiveness level one, level two, level three. We're at forgiveness level four. This is unconditional, undeserved forgiveness notice who asked your this is the second time he says this I don't know why these guys stay loyal to David the way he <laughs> chews on them who asked your opinion you sons of Zeruiah and David David exclaimed why have you become my adversary today this is not a day for killing people today I'm once again the king of Israel and he turned to Shimei and he said the most beautiful words you can ever hear from somebody your life will be spared. Jesus said that to the woman caught in adultery. Jesus said that to the thief on the cross. Jesus said that to you the day you became a Christian. Your sins are forgiven. You will not die. That's why Paul says, forgive one another the way God in Christ has forgiven you. What he's saying is, forgive one another out of a category four level of forgiveness forget one forget two forget three they're not available God only gives me one category of forgiveness it has to be unconditional and maybe undeserved and maybe maybe unrequested that's all right how's it going to hurt me Hey, if, if a person's unrepentant and they deserve to be punished, trust me, they will be. But it's not my job. Any more than it was David's job to kill King Saul so he could take his place. Any more than it was David's job to punish this man because he had said things he shouldn't have. That's not David's job. Vengeance is mine. I repay, says the Lord. We need to get out of the judgment business. It's not our job. It's not our job to sort out the good and the bad. Jesus says when you go in the field, I know there's weeds out there, he says. He's talking about the church. There's weeds in the church. 
He says, I know there's weeds out there, but if you start pulling out the weeds, what are you going to do to the good plants? You're going to pull them up too. Leave the dead gum things alone. When God does the harvest, he's he got a magic machine, sorts that stuff out. He's got like a cotton gin that just takes the fiber and leaves the other stuff, you know? That's what judgment's for. It's not what I'm here for. Something to think about. So I go back to my original question. Is there somebody in your life that you're still holding it over? And if so, why? And if so, how's it working for you? Who's thinking about that injustice, them or you? Who's being controlled by that injustice, them or you? Who's being haunted by it, them or you? And what would God prefer that you do? Hey, I've been mistreated. You have too. I choose to let it go. I choose to let it go. Why? Because, number one, it's what God wants me to do, and it makes him happy. But, number two, I have found that by following the wise way of God in this, it has also healed my wounds and made me better. By the way, once you start forgiving, it gets easier. It gets easier. So, if you're not a Christian, you need forgiveness. You need forgiveness. God says we're to forgive one another following the example of what God has done for us in Christ. I don't expect a person who's not in Christ to be forgiving because they haven't experienced unconditional, undeserved, unrequested forgiveness. If you're not a Christian, you need to come to Jesus right now. Confess your faith in Him. Put your heart in His hands. Give your life to Him. Be baptized into Christ. Let Him wash away your sins, all your sins, even the ones you don't remember, even the ones you'll never ask about, all taken away, washed away all at once in the blood of the cross. That's why He says you're a new creature when you come out of the water because you're raised to walk in newness of life. It's all gone. Clean slate. Start all over. Then if you have problems with your life, you confess that to the Lord and He continues to wash you of your sins. But you've got to get in the flow first. If you're not a Christian, you need to do that. If you're a Christian, man, let's go to work, folks. We've all got some, we've all got some cleaning out to do there. And it may be a process, but let God move you along by holding the cross in front of you all the time. Look at every person you deal with through the shadow of the cross and it'll change your relationship.